Hello, this is Mike Thornton. Uh, I'm here and happy to be reporting to the meeting this year. I have Nora Olson with me in the office. Uh, she's hiding off camera. She'll be here in just a second. We're going to share our time today and uh, give you an update on what we've accomplished in the last 12 months on the Idaho Potato Commission funded project on quality. So first let me uh, share the slides. That should do it. Okay, um, this is a project we began about 12 months ago and it really started on, you know, taking that top 10 list we developed last year of top things you can do to focus on quality and really digging further to say, you know, what is going on with quality? What are some of the defects we see in shipments? Things like that. <laughs> and to even back up further than that, this started uh, in the 2016 crop where Walmart approached the Idaho industry and said, what can we do to work together to improve quality? And so we've taken from there and really burrowed down and looked at things going on in the 2017 crop year and uh, looked at some of the shipments, looked at things that are going on and, and really come up with some ideas of what we see in terms of quality at different points during the year. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Nora Olson and Nora's gonna really give you a progress report. All right, thank you everybody. And we again, we apologize for not being there in person, but unfortunately we both had other requirements or prerequisites that we needed to do. And so um, we're gonna to try to do this as best we can by video. So, as Mike said, we were really fortunate though, to start to get involved in this quality project by asking the, the initial question is, what are the issues? If there is a quality issue out there, you know what exactly are they or is it bruised is it cuts how do we kind of assess that so fortunately walmart was very gracious in, in allowing us to receive all the rejection and downgrade notices for the 2017 stored crop but only from february to august and use that kind of as a or take a caveat here is that um is that really that's a small snapshot of that season and so really we will continue to look and assess these kind of defects with time over the next year to two years to order to get an idea of the seasonal effect as well as the yearly effect that we see. But at least you can kind of get an idea of some of the data that we do have to date on what really happened during that time. So Walmart has many different distribution centers all throughout the United States. And they're located, you know, east, west, north, south, all, the, all these er certain areas in order to get their commodities or their crops or their produce to people in a, in a short amount of time. So we were able to identify when we get these rejection notices, where are these rejections occurring at? Where are the prominent areas? And what we were able to see at least again for this period between February and August is that really out of about 250 rejections or downgrades, 73% came from distribution centers or DCs, what we call them, um, in really that Southeast area of the US Include, but then also including the New Jersey, New York area. Really the other 27% of the rejections came from 37 other DCs. So really this was a kind of a nice way for us to see, okay, we can focus our efforts into these distribution centers. Why are we seeing additional rejections or, or downgrades in these areas? And some of the things that can first come to your mind is that one, it's in one geographical area, the Southeast portion of the United States. So are we seeing that some of the things that we think of when you're in those areas is that it's kind of warm and it's kind of humid. It's also very far from Idaho. So is there a difference in environmental conditions? Is it due to a long duration in trucks? Or are there other reasons for these additional uh, rejections out of these areas? But again, identifying, trying to identify what is contributing to potential risk or potential quality issues. So further taking that information on, okay, where are these occurring, but also what kind of quality assessments are they having? What kind of defects are they seeing with these rejections? So some of the first ones that you can see is that actually this pie chart 
breaks it up into several different categories. Dry rot in the blue, cuts and shatter in orange, black spot bruise in gray, pressure bruise in yellow, and then soft rot in red. And you can see that those actually are pretty well distributed between those five kind of categories. And then we have this other, maybe lenosols or some other kind of concerns, which is just a small portion. So by identifying this, again, from only February to August, but we have a pretty good idea of what are our major culprits? What are the, what are the defects that we really need to focus on? And unfortunately, these are big um, areas to work in, but the, over half of them are due to some sort of impact, physical impact, whether it occurred um, during harvest and handling, whether it occurred in, um, while we're getting the crop ready to be transferred, um, transported. But really these quality re, um, issues are not new. These are the same sort of ones that we've been dealing with really forever with potatoes, um, just because they are inherently susceptible to some of these either diseases or, or um, disorders. So back in the 1970s, they did quite a bit of assessment on looking at what are some of the defects that are occurring at some of those retailers. And by this, you can see actually the majority was soft rot at the time. So, hey, we have come a long ways in, in, in decreasing that. But really dry rot, black spot, and other kind of bruising were the, the additional culprits for quality degradation. So we're dealing with the same sort of things. Um, we're just kind of shifting those categories a little bit so we know where our mark is and what we need to work on. So here's just a few examples of some of the rejection notices, photographs that we receive over time. And again, just to get a snapshot of what maybe some of the dry rot is looking like, one of some of the cuts and shatters on the right hand side. And again, be aware that there is um, a certain amount that is allowable. It's not that there can't be any of these kind of defects, but either there's gonna be a pair away by weight, there's either gonna be a percentage of, of the, of the um, potatoes that you're assessing, things like that. So be aware that some are allowed, we just can't have a certain amount in excess. But really these kind of photographs and these kind of information helps us identify that, hey look, we need to put a little bit more emphasis into bruise management, especially in this case where we're having some sort of wound and dry rot, fusarium dry rot can enter or just even kind of cuts and abrasions like that. Black spot bruise is a consistent one that has been shown um, through several different varieties and several different um, times of the year. But really, you can imagine potatoes don't look like this when they leave the warehouse. And so are there other things that are happening to those potatoes in transit? And we'll come back to this a little bit later too. But black spot bruise and the excessive bruising like this is definitely a concern for quality. Other, which was, uh, another issue what, that was kind of surprising to us was the amount of pressure bruise and pressure bruise flattening that you can see on the outside is allowable excess up to a certain amount. But also what happens though too is that pressure bruise when it's cut will turn black in some circumstances. And so then you're asking for another uh, discoloration or disqualification because of that. We also saw some sunken and discoloration. And although this is not from a rejection photo, but it kind of gives you an idea of where some of this discoloration can come for where the, the, the skin has either flaked off, either maybe due to pink eye, or the, it was just um, sloughing in that area. And then they, the, the flesh underneath just couldn't heal properly. And it causes this blackened discoloration on the potato, which is just not a, a, a quality as, um, characteristic you want. And then soft rot. That's the ultimate one that um, obviously is, is, is a degradation that is can have a serious impact on the potatoes when they arrive and cause for immediate kind of rejection up to a 2% allowable uh, amount. This is the one that is, um, is we see prevalently in, in certain times of the year. And then there's also other things that can be shown up with some of these um, rejection notices, whether it's internal discoloration, such as from a virus, maybe mop top virus, or maybe there is linosol damage or chemical damage on the potato. And again, these don't, these don't qualify for very high levels of our rejection notices, but still are uh, observed and need to be um, identified and handled um, in that manner. So what about when do, when do we see the greatest amount of rejections? Again, this is just a small snapshot for the 2017 crop, 
looking from February to August. But what was kind of interesting was that our greatest amount of rejection by month was really in the month of May. And so there's a few things that could be happening during that time. One is that we may be transitioning from Norcotas to Russell Burbank. Um, but we also may be looking at non-refrigerated to refrigerated storages as well. And so that may be the shift from in, in that time period. Or maybe something else is going on. Maybe there was a, it was time of year. Maybe there was some sort of environmental conditions that were going on. But at least, again, it gives us an idea of where are our greatest levels of risk for having some sort of rejection or quality degradation. And so we can start to look at maybe what was contributing to some of these quality issues during that time, during that time period. It also helps us to look at what kind of defects we were observing by these rejection notice over the course of the time. And the gray bar indicates the amount of black spot bruise rejections that we saw from February to August. And what's kind of interesting is that they maintain a fairly um, similar level throughout all those months. Same with some of the other kind of minor categories. But what we really saw a spike in the months of May and kind of a little bit in July is the amount of dry rot, is the amount of shatter, is the amount of pressure bruise, and the amount of soft rot. And so again, we can see that maybe black spot is gonna be a more stagnant um, issue that we can deal with, and that we have to really deal with more of acute issues um, relating to dry rot, soft rot, shatter, and things like that. So again, this is all trying to tell us a story of what do we need to um, put a lot more emphasis into research and education on, and to identify what are the problems, when are the problems, and ide ideally what can we do about those problems. Because obviously potatoes do not look like this when they leave the shed. And so something could be happening potentially in transit that's really kind of accentuating or um, encouraging a defect to look worse by the time it enters or arrives at its destination two to five days later. So Mike and I, um, what we did was we tracked at least four loads to looking at two, three distribution centers. So this helped us again, now that we were able to assess them, what did, how did they look at the shed? What are some of the transit conditions? So we looked at temperature, humidity, recording as they were going in transit. And then we were able to identify or assess quality once they got to the distribution center as well as we held some potatoes ourselves. So we're kind of trying to observe, you know, what is going on, what do we, what are we seeing for sure ourselves? But then also where it allows us to look at how are, how are these inspections occurring and what is kind of the quality when they do arrive. So here's Mike and I, hard at work, um, doing our science thing and really looking at each individual kind of defect. We went into absolute uh, extremes in terms of trying to get, identify is there any potential for these potatoes to have any kind of defect or concerns when they get to the other end. And so that was good for us just to kind of um, get an up close and personal um, perspective on that. So one of the first things that we were able to do is that we met the potatoes at the other end. So it's kind of like Christmas morning, they opened up the trucks and we were able to get our, our pallets out and see, hey, these potatoes that we looked at at in Idaho, how are they looking like in Arkansas or North Carolina or even Utah? So, but we wanted to back up too, is that what were the conditions like of these potatoes as they were moving through the country? And so I just wanna follow a little bit on this graph. This is what the potatoes actually were, or the container was, was recording the conditions, is that this, this red bar was, indicates the temperature set point. And the temperature set point of that reefer unit was 42 degrees. Now this blue bar, or this blue line up here, and you can see it oscillate up and down a little bit, that's what the temperature was actually being recorded in the pallets, in the bales. And so one thing to notice is that, hey, we wanted that reefer at 42 degrees, but really the temperature of those potatoes were closer to about 53 degrees, 52 degrees. Another thing you wanna point out is this relative humidity being recorded, is this is the orange line. And you can see this go up and down, up and down, up and down, but it kind of gives us an idea in certain locations or certain times during transit, are those humidity levels going up to the point that we have to be worried about some sort of condensation event as well. So what the take home is on this happened to be, an, on this um, reefer unit would be that we want a certain temperature, we verified that yes, that reefer was set at that temperature, but that temperature was not achieved. 
And so was there a malfunction? Yes, and not saying this happens all the time, but it was kind of an indicator that, that, that there are conditions that we're, are not necessarily what we want um, the potatoes to be at with, in these weather and transit. Actually, then the second unit that we looked at, and another reefer, this was going to a different location, is that again, this red bar indicates the, re the temperature set point that we wanted, and that was about 42 degrees. The temperature recorded is the blue line. And for one thing though, the potatoes came in probably at about 55 degrees and never really reached to that temperature set point. And again, these are in bales that are, that are loaded into, onto a pallet and into the, the back of the reefer unit. I think that brings up a good point though too, is that these reefer units are only intended to keep, maintain a temperature. Uh, really whatever temperature you want those potatoes to be at really almost have to be at that temperature as they're going into the reefer unit. Because one thing about it is that if we're trying to pull heat out of those potatoes and bring them down to a colder temperature. And we're all aware is that warmer temperature holds more moisture and so once you start going down to temperatures and if you are really truly able to do that is that that moisture has to go somewhere and especially these units aren't really set up to exhaust heat and exhaust out the internal um, conditions or the internal air is that that you have the potential for condensation to occur because that moisture has to go somewhere and we could record this and see that all of a sudden the rel relative humidity started to get fairly high in those in those bales on, in that pallet. It also may be an indicator though, also is that what about the conditions outside in, um, conditions as we're entering in some of these hu southeast humid areas of the, of, the, of the United States. This is just representing some of the condensation events that could occur and kind of the unknowns of how these reefer units work in terms of being able to bring in and distribute air and um, throughout the, the product. And so it is somewhat like a little storage, but again, we're not able to control everything that we want, nor are we able to exhaust out a lot of that, that warm and humid air as well. This is just another example of some temperature recordings that we saw. Uh, one is that you can see the fluctuations that occurred actually is that that this one this particular reefer unit fluctuated between 35 degrees and about 49 degrees and again if you have any kind of a bit availability of moisture that you might reach that dew point you potentially have condensation events occurring in those poly bags and as what we're most afraid of when a condensation event occurs in a poly bag is that you increase your risk for um, soft rot um, breakdown so these recording, these temperature recording devices are really um, important to have in your trucks. More importantly is to know is that if a problem does occur, yeah, you can't fix it, but at least you can identify um, what happened and try to then not have that happen in the future. So a lot of this is that we're trying to learn from these experiences and learn to um, under, better understand the circumstances that these trucks are put under and how that that crop is responding to those trucking environments. So some of the questions we had is that, do you set it on a continuous or do you have it on a cycle? Is the vent open or closed? And the type of vents and all these things that, that are involved in, in transporting the potatoes and trying to make sure that we are at those humidities and we are at those temperatures that are desired and proper for those potatoes at that point. So we're starting to cut kind a of look at this packaging and, and truck conditions, but much more of the truck is the black box. You know, we say goodbye to them at the shed and then other people, you know, get to see them at the other end and, you know, what happened during that time. And so it really is important for us to try to get a better handle on what should those temperatures be in that black box. Um, what about the humidity and the potential for condensation? And what about the inability or hopefully the ability to move air around in those in that um, truck um, in order to get the air supply that we need plus to um, moderate temperatures and humidity as we need to. Because unfortunately, a lot of those events can occur in kind of microclimates within the bales, um, also within the pallets. So we may need to identify what are these conditions in the truck by location, depending upon where we are sending that truck to, and then how long are they gonna be in that truck as well. 
So stay tuned. This is definitely a direction that Mike and I have identified as the black box is something that we need to uh, um, assess a little bit better in terms of to be able to dial in those, those ideal conditions for those potatoes. So one thing too, is that we go back to the packing shed is that I think everybody needs to establish their own go, no go kind of situation. For those of you who saw that movie Hidden Figures, you know, I love that time when John Glenn is trying to decide, is he gonna try to um, get sent up into space and to try to land on the moon? But what his fear was is that what about the calculations? Are they ready for him to re-enter Earth when he comes back down? And so he's asking, hey, is, you know, make sure the numbers are right. Is it a go or a no-go situation? And so many times I think we're at the same, we're at that same spot, is trying to make that decision when these potatoes leave the shed, is it really a go or a no-go? Are they at the greater risk for having some sort of quality issue when they reach their destination? And I think that it's going to probably depend upon, you know, what destination it is, what is the customer, what are the types of quality issues that you are seeing with those potatoes, and what we know about transit and things like that in terms of knowing is that will they maybe turn on us during that time? Will they not make it? And so this is a very individual assessment. Each shed needs to identify what are their quality controls that are going to denote whether it's a go or a no-go or do something different with those potatoes. Because again, potatoes don't look like this when they're leaving the shed. We have um, strict quality grades that are in place and inspections that are in place to ensure that, that we are not shipping potatoes that have this much bruise. So we know that things are occurring in transit. We know that for sure, but we just need to identify is that what is the risk at the shed that may then um, put these potatoes or what, what are the conditions of the potatoes that may put those potatoes at greater risk when they do enter the on the retail side of things and especially too because a lot of the rejection notices that we see they are not just barely over the mark of being rejected in a lot of situations and, and here's just an example is that maybe 21 percent 11 percent 15 percent 17 percent of damage and again, when you're only allowed maybe 2% or 5% or even 7%, is that we're definitely much higher than what those allowable levels are, um, depending upon what we're looking at. And so be aware that, that really there's some serious things that are occurring during that time, and so the risk can be quite extreme. But realize too is that not all bruises, let's just say, or not all defects are scorable. And here's an example on the left that if you peel that potato, you'd see quite a bit of bruise. But when you actually cut it into a scoreable, let's just say a 5%, it is not going to be a rejected load. And so again, we're not asking for perfect potatoes to be moved around, but sometimes even a potato that looks like this, again, whatever unfavorable conditions we may put it under, is that it may actually turn into a scoreable potato by the time it reaches its destination. So what about, kind of backing up, is that we know that what our issues are, what are the major defects that we're seeing. We know that, um, is that things can change in transit, but let's back up a little bit and see that, hey, what kind of bruising or what kind of damage is occurring at harvest and at the shed? And so we were able to uh, do some bruise assessments at multiple packing sheds in the past um, year, as well as some harvest operations. And ideally what we're just looking for, risk for impact and just awareness is that okay, we can identify some areas that may lead to um, increasing bruise level, um, whether, and then that way then, then people can make adjustments and to try to minimize those risks as much as possible. So we really emphasize a lot of using the instrumented sphere or what we affectionately call the bruise ball. And again, this is able to, you're able to run it through your harvest operation, your windrowers, your harvesters, your you know, conveyors, all of that but you're also able to run it through a packing shed. And the nice thing about this is that it can identify points of greatest impact or force that could damage potatoes. Now, one thing about this is that it does not take into account the physiology of the tuber, the temperature of the potato, the variety, the hydration, all the other components that we know that can contribute to um, greater potential or lessen your potential for bruise. All this is gonna tell us is that, hey, look, you have a risk of having a higher than desirable impact on that potato, and therefore you may have additional damage in that area. 
And so sometimes it is to validate, hey, I think I have some issues in this area, or I may be able to see um, places in your operation that you can't really observe that easily or make modifications um, quickly. And so these are a useful tool um, to use in those situations. Here's an example of graphs that we are able to get from this bruise ball. And really what it shows, this red line, anything of any kind of like line above that red line, any kind of dots, whatever you want to say, indicates that there's an impact greater than what may be desirable for those potatoes to minimize bruise. And so here we're able to identify certain equipment in a packing shed that is contr potentially contributing to a greater risk for bruise. And so we're able to run through this, give information to the packing shed, and then they can say, hey, look, we're gonna make some modifications in that area to try to minimize essentially that, those points and to bring them down below that, that red bar. And again, a useful tool, um, but at least shows you where your greatest risks are. Because we know that some bruise can happen at, a, at the sheds, but we know a lot of it is being contributed um, from harvest and handling. So even though bruise numbers can increase from the cellar from the, and to the truck, and then by the time it gets to the bag, we can actually measure and see that there are an increase in shatter, increase in black spot bruise. Not in all sheds, but in, in, in several of them. But it does not always equate to a scorable defect. And so again, we are moving potatoes around a lot. They are being handled. And so of course, with any handling, there always is the greater risk for um, some sort of bruise to occur. So what about some of the other factors that may be contributing to some of these, these quality rejections? And so this is where we've been able to emphasize a little bit more on research and some of that physiology that even though the, the bruise ball can't pick up on, but we can try to pick up on when does the potato become a little bit more susceptible to certain force um, and causing bruise. So we're able to look at different varieties such as North Dakota strains, some of these other varieties that may be processed potatoes, but also fresh packed potatoes such as Teton and Payette. We're able to look at what is the drop height that, and pulp temperatures of the, that may contribute to greater bruise and of those potatoes hours to form black spot, because black spot. that's one thing too, is that we're all wanting to know how are these potatoes responding to, to harvest conditions or handling conditions, and we want to be able to make adjustments on the fly. Unfortunately, black spot takes time to um, develop into that blackening and actually to see, so we want to be able to speed up that process. We're also looking at hydration measurements and then impact of maturity and post-kill um, soil moisture. So stay tuned on a lot of this. This is all being put together just to try to add information, add new um, tools to our tools toolbox in order to better understand how to deal with some of these um, bruising susceptibility and bruising situations. Here's just a prime example of where we're looking at pay at reset on the on the top half of the um, slide and russet burbank on the lower half. And what we do is we drop a pendulum, a weighted, kind of a weighted weight, a known weight, um, onto the potato from a certain distance so that we're, we are bruising all the potatoes the same way. But one thing I just want to point out right away is that, you know, we can, we can kind of figure that russet burbank is known for having some bruising. But when you start looking at some of these other varieties, you can see that they tend to bruise and shatter a little bit more than maybe russet burbank. So really, knowing variety susceptibility is so important in trying to identify how are we going to manage those potatoes out in the field. Well, here's just an example where we looked at all these different varieties. We dropped that weight from either 6 inches or 12 inches, and what kind of black spot bruise did we have? So one of the first things that you can kind of see, even at 6 inches, the differences in varieties where you have Bannock, Clearwater, and Payette Russet all being very high, even at that lower drop. Um, compared to some of these other varieties. And then whether you see a difference of whether you're dropping it at 12 inches or six, six inches. One, you don't see that big of a difference between Bannock, Clearwater, and Payette when you start to go to those um, higher distances, but you do see an increase with some of these others such as Burbank, Ranger, and Umatilla. Again, stressing that drop height and how we're managing those potatoes, um, babying them along. Some are gonna have to be babied differently than others. And so when we, when we are trying to harvest and handle things compared to Russet Burbank, 
we may need to adjust that for some of these other varieties. Same, um, what we did was when we looked at some of the differences in Norcota strains, that's been a question by many people is that we were so used to the standard Norcota and now we've evolved so far away from those on these different lines, is that do they kind of respond all the same? And for the most part, yes. In terms of black spot brews at the different drop heights, we get fairly similar responses between um, the different strains that we observed here, whether it was Norcota 3, 296, 278, or a 112 compared to the standard Norcota. But there's also that factor of temperature. Pulp temperatures um, can influence substantially how a potato is going to respond to bruising. And here's an example of shatter brews where at the colder temperatures of 45 degrees, we see greater shatter brews with all these varieties compared to your warmer temperatures. And, um, but where some are gonna be a lot more responsive to a difference between 55 and 65 degrees, such as like Russet Burbank, we don't see that as much with Clearwater Russet. But we also see too, is again, this differential in between all the different varieties in terms of susceptibility to shatter as well as, as previously shown with black spot brews. So be aware of the different varieties and how they're going to respond. Um, I think too is that um, we're going to turn this over to, to Mike now who's going to tell us a little bit more about the physiology of the potato and how it's going to respond in, um, in certain 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 circumstances. But I think too is that we're reading, really leading into a lot of more research areas and education areas, especially as it relates to um, conditions at harvest of the potato, both physiology as well as harvest management. We're going to look a lot more into storage management, early storage management, as well as how we're treating those potatoes as we go in terms of pressure brews. And so really this has given us a whole different kind of arena to look at and to, to focus certain areas um, on identifying those five greatest needs in terms of quality degradation. All right, Noir, thank you. I don't know about you guys, but I've already learned two important pieces of information as Nora's gone along. First of all, she's way better at this video stuff than I am and probably should be reading the evening news. Whereas I struggle to uh, chew gum and walk at the same time when it comes to this technology and probably should stay away from it. So getting back to, you know, you've seen a bunch of pictures of bruised potatoes, rotten potatoes, but when it comes down to it, to the, to the really base message, it's that it takes a physical impact to cause a bruise, whether it's black spot bruise and it's followed by this chemical reaction that causes the darkening that you see on the screen or a shatter bruise. Either one, we have to have that physical impact. And especially for shatter bruise or any kind of bruise that breaks that skin, what we're doing is we're breaking that natural barrier that helps the potato resist infection by diseases. So let's go and look at you know, how the disease directly infects through those wounds. And you can see it here. You can see the starting point where a soft rot type organism can get into the tuber or a dry rot organism can come straight in through that impact area and, and cause a defect. And again, if you think about that, if you go back to our pie chart of the five most common defects we see in these rejections and you start partitioning them out by the ones that are directly associated with an impact, so the cuts and shatters, black spot, bruise, uh, and then you add on the indirect ones where the dry rot has come in through that bruise or soft rot has come in through that bruise, you see that almost all of that pie is associated with some kind of impact related defect, either the bruise directly or decay. So, you know, again, it's important to ask where are all these impacts coming from, particularly the ones that are causing scorable defects. Nora already pointed out that when we follow potatoes through the packing shed, we see an increase in black spot bruise, we see an increase in shatter bruise, but it's usually not of the scorable type. And what we really notice is that a lot of the scorable defects are coming from the handling that occurs as we get the potatoes out of the field and into storage. So in terms of the uh, 
harvesting operations we've evaluated. We can go in and we can take samples and we can look at, you know, how many of the potatoes have, you know, one bruise damage, two, three, how many are so and shatter, and we can just follow that along through the harvesting operation. And first thing you should notice for this particular harvester uh, operation is that when we looked at the windrower, we were getting 50% of the potatoes showing some level of injury right off the windrower. Theoretically, that should not happen. The windrower is there to first make the harvesting operation more efficient, but also to make it so that the harvester runs closer to capacity and we have less overall brews. Well, if we're getting 50% damage right off the wind roar, we're probably not accomplishing that second piece of that. We're probably not lowering our overall um, brews injury as we harvest the crop. And I think one of the things that this points out is that, you know, if you put a really inexperienced operator on a wind rower, which is where most machinery operators start, they can do a lot of damage if they don't know how to run that wind rower. So to address that, we've uh, made a video that uh, narrates in English and Spanish, you know, the basic principles of how do you operate a windrower correctly to reduce brews. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here when we get to the end and talk about extension projects that we've done as part of this quality. And you can see that here. You can see the, how the, the windrower is operating through the field. And just like a harvester, if you don't operate it correctly, there's plenty of uh, potential spots where you can have impacts that cause bruises. So when we go back and then start look at the next step through the harvester, what we see is that, you know, how you harvest or how you operate the harvester also is really important because we can see, you know, here we've got a harvester that's not appearing to add any additional brews to what was coming off the wind rower. And here's one that's adding substantial brews. And again, that's probably a difference in level of experience or in just paying attention between these two harvester operators. So we've gone ahead and made a, another video on, you know, how do you operate a harvester to minimize brews? And then again, just realizing that over time, as we move potatoes from one piece of equipment to the next, to the next, and into things like dirt eliminators, there's a potential for the number of bruises to increase. And that's really related to the, the force of impacts those potatoes are exposed to as they move, move through machinery. And what we're trying to uh, illustrate here is some data that we've taken with the bruise ball, where we drop that piece of equipment from known heights to all the way up to 14 inches and just recorded the maximum force. And what you see is that anything that is bare metal, so bare chain, a bare uh, solid metal surface, we get really high impact numbers, really high forces that are very likely to cause bruising. Now, if we drop those same potatoes or the, the bruise ball onto something that's softer, that has some cushioning, like belt or like another potato, the impacts are much less. So what you drop those potatoes on is almost as important as how far that you drop those potatoes is the take home message here. The other way to look at this information is kind of, we know that around 100 G's of force Measure with that bruise ball is kind of an area where you're likely to start seeing bruise defects. So if you're dropping onto a bare chain, your allowable drop height is only two inches before you're likely to start seeing some bruise damage. On metal, it's four inches. So you got a very small uh, margin for error on hard surfaces. On the cushion surface, whether they're belting or another potato, now our margin for air where we're gonna uh, be able to drop the potatoes and not have a significant damage goes up to closer to eight to 14 inches. So again, what you drop those potatoes onto is really critical. And this is why in some of the videos and some of the written documents that we put out on bruising, we really emphasize this concept of volume equal capacity. So using potatoes to cushion potatoes and then using padding, using you know, the absorptive qualities of materials like foam and belting to reduce the impacts. And just to give you an idea, you know, some places in the harvester and operating equipment, uh, metal points of contact and where you can get uh, direct uh, impact forces are very obvious like they are here and here. 
Some of them are less obvious. You know, you got to be looking for places where the metal is now exposed because the potatoes have worn down through that protective belting. And likewise, on this stinger here, you can see that they did a good job of attempting to reduce the level of impacts by adding this belting, but now that belting is worn through in spots. And so some of the potatoes are going to hit bare metal, even though we've attempted to cushion that drop. So one of the things we wanted to do with this quality project is really bring a focus to quality and what can everybody in the handling chain do to improve quality. And if I had to, to say it's one thing, it's really focus on brews to begin with. So in our extension uh, programs, the presentations, the newsletters we've been putting out through the Pulse and the Potato Commission, the bulletins, the conversations that we've had when we've gone out and do, done the bruise ball testing, we've really been focusing on, you know, how do we get everybody to focus on handling potatoes gently? As I said, this fall we went out uh, with uh, a lot of help from industry and with Travis Blacker and Bill Schaefer, and we put together uh, two videos, one on how do you operate a windrower in the best way to reduce bruise, and how do you operate a harvester, and those are posted online now. They're available in both English and Spanish. Uh, and then we also have the narration available in English and Spanish. So you can print it off and hand it to your guys after they look at the video or however you want to reinforce the message. And then we have plans to do that for another of the, uh, bunch of the operations under which potatoes go through and could be bruised like right at the storage during uh, loading of the storage and loading trucks, things like that. We also have uh, developed these stickers to put right on your equipment. So you have a direct visual reminder anytime you buy that equipment that, hey, you need to operate this in a way to reduce bruise. And I think Travis brought a whole bunch of those today to hand out to people that want them to, to use on their equipment. Likewise, uh, with Potato Commission, we developed the top 10 list from last year into a couple posters, one that focuses on you know, top 10 during the production cycle and one that focuses on top 10 during uh, packing and shipping. And then finally, we've posted a lot of this information into one online quality manual that's on our website. And here you see the website address and you can see how we've organized everything into a bruise management category by, you know, what do I need to know in season? What do I need to know at harvest? What do I need to know at storage? So all this information is broken down by different topics and you can get just about anything you want on bruise reduction on this website. I mentioned the poster. Here's an example of just breaking down these top 10 things you can do to focus on quality and they're really simple visual clues of doing things like, you know, planting the right kind of fields, monitoring temperatures, you know, avoiding drops, things like that. So again, Travis has a supply of those posters available that he's, uh, I think, providing today at this meeting. So if I had to wrap up what we've learned in the last 12 months, you know, I'd say that, you know, we've identified the top five most common defects that we see in potatoes that are shipped and rejected. Uh, at the receiving point, and those are the ones you see here, dry rot, cut shatter, soft rot, pressure bruise, and black spot. And because we can identify those, then we can start pinpointing where we need to focus to reduce those defects. And it's in the harvesting and packing shed operations, it's reducing pr pressure bruise and storage, and really realizing that you may not see that pressure bruise cut black at the shed, but after those potatoes spend a few days, in a truck going to the retail market, then all of a sudden you see more black pressure bruise, you see more black spot. So the small problem can turn into a larger problem. We also saw when we followed these shipments down into the Southeast uh, US production area or, sh or shipping area that you know condensation, airflow, what's going on with temperatures in the truck can contribute to a loss in quality during storage. So we really need to start figuring out, you know, a better way to monitor and assess what's the best conditions to get these potatoes 
particularly to some of these really tough areas where the humidity and temperatures are not favorable outside that truck. How do we, how do we hold them as best we can? We've done these quality assessments in the field storage shed and at the distribution center and, and really been able to see how quality changes over time and some of the things that may be contributing to that. And then as Nora pointed out, we've uh, identified some areas like varieties, hydration, things like that, that need a little bit more research. So we can really drill down to good recommendations for you guys. So with that, I'm gonna end again with our Bruce website, uh, just to make sure you have that. Um, again, if you have any questions, if you have things where you'd like uh, the University of Idaho to come out and help you assess your packing shed or your harvester operations, that's what we'd like to be able to do uh, going forward and uh, really, really be able to provide you guys with some good research and extension for improving quality going forward. So with that, I hope you guys uh, enjoy the rest of your meeting and that uh, from uh, that you'll uh, agree that we made some substantial progress on this project and uh, look forward to reporting more project updates in the future.